Good morning. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. I don't know, last year we were so busy planting this thing and getting started that, man, it just didn't feel like Christmas. And this year we were super intentional on making sure we felt that. So we've been all serious this year. We started, we put our tree up the day after Halloween. Anybody else do that? That's right. Just a couple, right? So if you want to get festive, you're feeling blue, just come to our house. And uh, listen, it's kind of a, man, I really just want to blast off, but man, we can't ignore, and I hope pastors all around aren't ignoring uh, or avoiding what happened in Connecticut with those kids getting shot. And I'd, I'd just like to say this about it, is that to me, it just creates the urgency of the gospel. It means we've got to be serious in knowing God's word and being able to relay God's word to people to offer them hope that they don't have. If you're not saved, man, it's hard to understand. Even when you are saved, it's hard to understand why things happen or to what angle to take. But, you know, here's what I know. I know that if anybody knows about losing their child in a cruel manner, it's God, right? So he knows all about that, and he's the only one that can provide this type of comfort. So, man, just pray for their hope and their healing and their comfort. Man, maybe something about this will open their eyes and their thoughts about who God is and maybe what their purpose is. And so if you will seriously be in prayer, I know you can't drive up there and do that, but God gave you something called prayer to petition him and to, to ask for those things, okay? So be in prayer for those people. We are in week two of the gift, the series we're calling The Gift, and that gift is Jesus Christ, the hope that comes with him, that salvation that God gave us his best gift that he could give. And last week, we uh, really hung our hat on this, and we're continuing this thought this week, is you are what you believe. That's a fact. That's what shapes you into who you are, is what you believe. And last week, we had to nail this down. We knew people would be coming because it's Christmas and that's awesome. We want to have the doors wide open and make sure that if what we thought is, if we can get people to understand, number one, who God is, and then who we are, who man is, who are we. So last week, we talked about who God is in case you missed it. Man, we learned that he is totally trustworthy. He is trustworthy because, listen, what you believe about God determines how you respond to him. When he speaks and challenges and directs you, what you believe about him is is how you respond to him. And the way that you respond to him, like when he calls you to do something, no matter how big or small it is, when he calls you to do it and you respond to it, listen, it determines what you receive from God. I'm not just talking about money, hopefully, maybe, whatever, but that you receive from God. Man, his blessings, his protection, maybe those things. But look, that's what we have to understand, what we believe about God. So we tried to nail that down. We used Mary. We, we really got really Christmassy last week. We used Mary, a teenage girl, probably 14 or 15. An angel approached her and said, look, you have favor with God. You have favor with God. And guess what? You're going to be pregnant, and you're going to have a baby. And you're going to call him Jesus. He's the hope of the world. And what we discovered last week was that, listen, sometimes the favor of God doesn't sound like a favor. But it is. It's a favor. She got, she got to give birth to the child of God. And she got to watch him grow and see his life unfold. Okay? And she was so willing to do that. So we really pressed down on what we believe about God. What we believe about God. So this week, we're looking in week two. What do we believe about man? What do we believe about us? And Because it really shapes who we are and, and what we believe. So here's what I know. I know that people are looking to feel significant, to do something that, to, that, that helps them to know that their life really counts for something. That it's not in vain that they live. It's not just a waste of breath or life. But they want to feel significant, that we pursue that. And, and, and everybody does that. They are, there's something that is such a priority for them. Listen, today's not going to feel like Christmas for a little while. And I know some of you probably got Christmas sweaters on, Santa Claus hats, stuff like that. But, uh, but we're going to get to this. It's so important that if we're going to receive the best gift ever given, and we've invited people so that they might be able to receive the best gift ever given, they have to understand their position. They have to understand our condition. We know that God is trustworthy. And now we've got to understand who we are. And so what I want to look at today is, is just to understand that people are chasing significance. They do. They feel like if they can nail something down, something they're good at, something that, that, that makes them feel comfortable and safe, that they somehow receive success. And somebody do that, do, some people do that with parenting. They really do. Some people, 
have significance or pursuing significance on how well they parent. However you define that. That look, if I can, if I can be a good parent, if I can, if I can be successful, in that, then I have some type of self-worth. I have some type of value. Okay, I have some type of significance. And some people are in their career. They are all about their career. Nothing wrong with a career. And their employment, they are searching with all their heart and hoping to get that job, that position, that income, maybe that raise that look, would propel them into a position that they feel that, that they, they are significant, that they are, they are successful in providing for their family. If I can just provide well for my family, then that's where my significance my significance uh, shows itself. And the other one is, of course, a relationship, where you're married or pursuing a relationship, that if I can somehow position myself in a relationship, if I can make that such a top priority for myself, then there's something about doing that that gives me significance. There's something accomplished with that. There's some type of value or self-worth that I get from my relationship. Now, uh, Something inside of us speaks to that. And that's not a bad thing. None of those things are bad things. Please don't hear me say that. But when they begin to take priority over other things, that's when we've got issues. So here's how I know that people, when they pour into things, uh, that is a priority that's not God. And when they are parenting, it's based on whether or not, man, if my child is successful, then I'm a success. But also the opposite. Man, if he turns out to be a failure, I'm somehow of lesser value. I have less significance. I'm not, I'm a failure. I fell on, fallen on my face. So, what I want to really press down on is our value, our worth, and our significance, and how we wrap ourselves up in that, so tightly in that, and that identifies who we are and what we accomplish. So, what I want, to, want you to know is that that's not God's plan. It's not God's plan for, that to, for you to be wrapped up in that. He's got a design that's specifically for you. And here's the point today, and we'll just go ahead and jump off with this point. What creates your identity captures your worship. What creates your identity captures your worship. You might catch me saying that again. Listen, he wants our significance and our value and our identity to be wrapped up totally, 100% into him. He won't take a, a substitute for that. And what we know is whatever creates your identity, whatever you're pursuing and making that top priority for yourself is actually some, something you turn out to worship. Okay? So, what it does is it steals your affection. It, 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 it steals your loyalty, your uh, attention, it just, and, and your efforts. It just captures all of that, and that is your worship, okay? So if you're in your career, it steals your time and your emotional energy and your resource, okay? Um, and here's what I want to do. Today, just to press down home on what we're talking about, is we're going to be in Genesis chapter 3. That doesn't sound too Christmassy, I know, but uh, Genesis chapter 3. Now, what it's going to do, it's going to pop up on the board in just a second, uh, and we're just going to kind of go through it and see what we can pull out to make sure that we are positioning ourselves to realize the gift of God. That just where does this come from, this sin thing? Where, where, where does it come from? Here's the first point. Number one, we are sinners. And I know some people come in and say, I mean, this is why I don't go to church. I don't like to be, sit back and be called a sinner, but I want you to hang with me and just, just sit back and watch God's word unfold because here's the, here's the point. Sin is not just what we do, it's who we are. Sin is just not the things we do, the gesture we show somebody on I-85. It's not just a cuss word that slipped. It's not just a thought that we have, although that's sin. Sin's so much more than that. It's who we are. It's in our DNA. Okay? It's, it's at the root of who we are. And so what pops up as an issue of sin is if we seek anything that replaces our identity in Christ, then we are in sin. So here it goes. And Paul, Paul said this in 2 Corinthians. He says, if anyone is in Christ, listen, he is a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. Look, he says we are a new creation. When we place our faith in Christ, we realize that he is a gift of salvation and hope. And, and we put our trust in him. The Bible says, Paul says very clearly, that we are a new creation. I was kind of floating through Walmart the other day. I work in the university area. And just kind of looking around at stuff. And I just want to find a, a, a brand. I'm not going to tell you what it is. Of just something that I was looking for. And it doesn't matter what it was. I just want the original thing. 
And, and what I kept seeing, I couldn't find the original thing anymore. Everything was 33% stronger. It was lemon scented. It was, uh, I mean, it was all these descriptions. Some even had new labels. I'm like, okay, man, I just want the real thing. And here, here's the thing. You're, we're none of those things. When we give, place our trust in Christ, okay, we give him our life. We, we're at that moment where we understand that, man, I am a sinner. Listen, he's not looking to make you new and improved. He doesn't just want to improve, give you, be, be a more improved version of who you already are. He doesn't want you to be 33% strong. He doesn't want you to be limits in it. He wants us to be brand spanking new. He, that's what he says. He said, in, in me, you are a new creation. And so, in just a couple of weeks, so many of us are going to make commitments. We're going to say what we're not going to eat and what we're not going to do. And I just want to say that uh, I just kind of quit making those because, let's face it, in, in about, you know, uh, by February, uh, you promised you wouldn't go to McDonald's and by February already in and some of you will be there by January the 3rd, All right? So, um, turning over a new leaf just doesn't work. God says we are a brand new creation. So, I want to go back to where it all started, and that's in Genesis chapter 3, and we're going to realize that our own, the only hope we have is in Jesus. Okay, I'll start reading and we'll just kind of cut through. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to, he said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden. Now, let's catch this. Satan is approaching Eve here. He's approaching her and he's saying, you know, first of all, let me say that Satan has no good plan for you. He is not on your team. He is not your cheerleader. He does not want the best for you. Okay, no matter how pretty it looks, no matter how tempting it is, he does not have your best in mind. And he's approaching, he's approaching Eve here and he's saying, uh, he's, he's, he's saying this. So this is what it says. He blessed them with all his stuff. He said, don't eat from one tree. And aren't we all like that? The serpent says, did he really say, did he really say that you couldn't eat from this tree? And so uh, I want to make this, I want you to notice this path of the enemy. It is that he questions the word of God. And so I'm, I'm burdened so much for God's word, especially over the past six months or so. I always have been, but for other people trying to stress the importance. He gives such clarity in that. And these issues that you don't even know you've, you're facing yet or that you will face, listen, he's offering so much hope through his word that when those situations come for yourself or your others that you'll be somehow prepared better for that. I really, really do that. But what the enemy does, the first thing he does, he, he, he doesn't run out of tricks here, is that questioning the word of God. But the Bible says that that, that God's word is sharper than two, any two-edged sword. It says it's the foundation of, 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 of who God is, okay? And, and that it's firm and it's true. So he starts with that. He starts questioning God's word. And the woman said to the serpent, may we eat fruit from the tree, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And you must not touch it or you will die. So then he moves into contradicting God's word. He says, you will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman. And, and, it's a, and he's saying, Eve, God is holding back on you. He is holding back something off, awesome for you. And verse 5 says, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And what he's saying is, he said, look, girlfriend, he is holding back. There's something good for you. God doesn't have your best in mind. There's something more that you can have. And I know the real story. You're not going to die. I know the story. So he contradicts God's word. And the Bible says this in verse 6. And we'll start nailing it down. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye. Kind of started justifying it. It is food and pleasing to the eye. And also desirable for gaining wisdom. She took some. And she ate it. She also gave some to her husband. Thanks, ladies. Who was with her and he ate it. Now, the transition, I think, of humanity is right here in, in this verse. That, listen, that Eve took something that was good. She took something good, listen, and made it ultimate. She made it the top priority. And in, in this case, it was wisdom. Listen, is wisdom a bad thing? 
Serpent says, you know, you can have wisdom of good and evil. Is it a bad thing? Wisdom is not bad. I count on wisdom every day. I pray for it as a parent, as a pastor, as a therapist, as a, as a father. I mean, I, mean, I mean, I just go on and on. I just ask God for wisdom. God, I can say the wrong thing. I need wisdom for you. It's, it's not that it's bad. It's good, but it, it can't be the ultimate. And that's where this started was she traded in what was good for the ultimate. So, if your parent, is parenting a kid bad? Is having a career or relationship bad? It's not. But when it takes priority, when it becomes the ultimate, listen, and some of you are like, where's he getting at? There are people that worship their children. And children are awesome, and we've got to be great parents. We should be the best parents. If we should be the best employees. But those things cannot be our priority. It's tra trading something that's good for the, for the ultimate. So in this moment, in this moment where she takes the fruit and she consumes the fruit and shares it, there's a ripple effect. In that moment, she, she traded in intimacy with God. She traded in a relationship with God. She traded in living by God's word. She traded that in. She traded in protection from God. She traded in something good for something ultimate. So everyone born after this, this event, we're all, because of this, we're all born into sin. Okay, so it's nothing you've, that you do. It's in your DNA, remember? It's, it's in your root. It's in the core of who you are. We are born with sin. We are born into that. But here's the reality. Uh, it's not just that we mess up, we screw up, we blow it. It's that it's a part of who we are. It's what we're born into. So sin, again, is not just what we do. It's who we are. So the Bible, God knew we'd need a solution to that. At this very moment, he knew that we would be chasing things and pursuing things and having self-worth and identity in things that weren't, weren't him. And so he knew there, there, there would, he would have to have a, a solution that would totally recreate what we, what we are. And so in verse 7 it says this, Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they realized they were naked. They realized they were naked. And here's the point I want to make, is recognizing is not the same thing as repenting. So many people can identify in their own life where, where their sin is, what they struggle with. But that is not the same. Acknowledging sin and recognizing is not the same as repenting. That's such a churchy word. And repenting just means to move away the opposite direction of where you're headed and heading towards God. God, the Bible calls that repenting. And so before this, the Bible says that they were, they were naked and unashamed, right? Guys, we could have been walking around naked all the time, but they blew it. They blew it. They were unashamed. It's nothing that was, they were walking around with purity of their mind and their hearts before that. But they, but this is what it says. It said, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves because they realized that they were naked. Let me say that again. They sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord as he was walking in the garden of the cool day. And they hid from the Lord among the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called the man, the man, and said, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid. I was naked, so I hid. So listen, so that moment, they go from, in verse 6, they go from a, a, an intimate connection with God. They're walking with God in the cool of the day. They're having conversation with God. They're, they're, they're with God. And they go from that to suddenly their world changing, and they're, they're distant from God. And they realize they're naked, and they're, they, they make all this effort to cover up. They start to cover up. And here's the reality, that we do the same thing. You and I do the exact same thing with the, these things in our life. And sometimes there's a moment of clarity where we realize, man, I'm naked. I'm without God. Sometimes those moments come in painful moments, at painful times that make us realize that I'm naked and I'm without God. He is not with me. So in those moments we realize that, man, this relationship that I've just been pursuing it's just been a fig leaf to cover up what God needs to, to remake and transform. This job, 
It's just been a fig leaf. It's just been something where I've tried to fulfill where God needed to be. It's been such a priority for me. It's something I pursued with all my heart. And you began to worship. But God sent his only son, listen. He sent his only son knowing that, that we had a price that we couldn't pay. That this sin issue, this sin problem that we're born with, we don't catch it. We don't acquire it. We're born with it. It's inside of us. Now here's what I think he started doing in, in verse 6. I think immediately he already had in his mind what he was going to do. That there will be this teenage girl, she's 15, and he's going to use her, and he's going to use her life to bring Jesus into the world. So that we would receive the best gift ever given. And that we could recognize and see our sin, but do more than that, that we would repent. We would see that God was pursuing us, that, that he, wanted, he wants more for our life than what we pursue. So it's not just what we do, it's who we are. Now Gary and the guys are going to be coming up here, I think, in just a second. I told you this would be kind of dreary today. But listen, in our sin, in our moment, when we realize the light bulb finally goes off and so, for so many of you, listen, that's, that maybe you've never thought about it before. It's never come so strongly on you. There's an internal pool that says, I am a sinner. I am without God. I've, I've, I've pursued so many things as fig leaves to cover up my life when God wants to not just expose us, that's not his goal. He wants to cover us in his love and his forgiveness that only he can do. And I love this part, this, this last part where God is calling for Adam. He says, where are you? Adam, where are you? You know, and I've, I've said before that, man, it's hard to play hide and seek with God. I mean, he wins every time. It's just not fair. And there's no doubt that when he's asking Adam this, listen, it's not that he doesn't know where Adam is. He wants Adam to know where he is. Not his location, but his state of mind. Where are you? And for some of you, that's the case. Maybe you've been a, avoiding God or running from God. Maybe you've had your guard up with God for so long. But maybe now you feel his pursuit of you. Maybe it's this time of year. Maybe it's what's happened recently in Connecticut or whatever it might be. Circumstances in your life. You're starting to feel that God is pursuing you. He's asking, where are you? It's not that he doesn't know where you are. He wants you to realize where you are. I want to say something about my kids. I could totally relate to this because my kids are pretty fun. I'm, I'm a pretty good dad, I would admit. You know? uh, I, just, I just am. I think because I use humor so much. You know, I'm pretty, pretty flexible. I'm pretty, uh, I like to engage in conversation. Everything's not always serious, although it can be. Um, but I just love my kids. My favorite thing, uh, my wife used to act like maybe, are you going to be okay when you're gone? I'm like, yeah, get out of here. Go shop, go have fun, whatever it is that you're doing. We'll be great. And man, I'm, I'm letting my kids run around, do crazy stuff. And, and I'm, the, I'm the guy that lets his kids pamper hanging down to here. This is swinging. And I just see how much it can hold, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and, and my kids are... We build stuff up in the house. Of the, not, a, not a living room fort tent, but a house fort tent. You know what I'm saying? That's me because, you know, I'm making pirate ships and whatever. So I love it. And when, the, when, when Holly will come home or anybody else, it's like, okay, it's over. But I love to do fun stuff. I'm always kidding around. I'm threatening to tell my kids, I'm going to put your hand in the toilet. And uh, they think I'm kidding. But one time I did it, I went, don't tell mommy. Because it's just fun and we connect in that way. It's very intimate. And I know that when they get older, they're going to really look back at that. And they're going to they're gonna probably have me committed. But then they'll, they'll say, man, he cared. We had a good time and we really connected. So I'm trying to spill that over to my little, my little nieces now. They think I'm crazy. But one day I'll be their favorite person. But I'm saying all that to say this. You're probably the same way with this. Is When kids are small, I remember pulling up to my house. And you can hear through the window, I guess, your kids saying, Daddy's home. Daddy's home. And so I, it was a little bit of excitement, you know, and for them and for me. And I'd come in and, and, and both of them at their young ages would, would hide. They would go hide. And I, I, I got to be honest, I really liked it. Uh, I, 
I knew it wouldn't last forever, but I enjoyed it while it lasted. And I love, especially uh, Rebecca, when she was smaller, she would tell you, I'm hiding. <laughs> okay. And sometimes you'd see their feet sticking out from the bottom. You would see, you know, of the bed or whatever, and they're giggling. And, and I would just say, well, Holly, have you, seen, have you seen Rebecca? And they'd say, she'd say, no, I hadn't seen her. <laughs> so she's hiding. Now listen, it's not that I didn't, when I drove up to my house, that I didn't know where she was. I knew she was at the house every day. And I would, it's, it's not that I didn't care. I was bored and just, uh, was just doing a routine. This is something I enjoyed. And there was something about, what I liked most about that was particularly when she was younger, Rebecca was, she was willing to tell me that she was hiding. I'm hiding. And then sometimes she'd <gasps> catch herself looking and then, but I loved it. I loved that she was willing to tell me that she was hiding. Okay? Because I love to look for her. And I just want you to know that I love here that God knows exactly where Adam is. It's not that he can't find him. But listen, God in his love, I want you to feel this, that God with his love pursues you. He loves you. It doesn't matter how you feel about him. Some of you have got your guard really up with your circumstances. He loves you and he's going to keep coming at you. One thing is, is, is kids grow up and sometimes maybe they get too big to let you know that they're hiding. I think that's how a lot of people in church are. Maybe think they're a little big or maybe they're afraid. Maybe they're afraid of God's response to, to the words, I've been hiding God. I've been sowing fig leaves. I've been chasing things and people and stuff, possessions and status. I've been sowing fig leaves, God, and look, it replaced my worship of you. All that time should have been worship of you. And some of you are feeling this and hearing it, and you're saying, man, that's me. I've been hiding from God. I'm hiding. I'm sowing fig leaves. And he's got an identity and a self-worth for you that can't be replaced by the things that you've been pursuing. And if you're going to really recognize his gift for you, God's best gift that he's ever given, we've got to realize where we are. We are born into sin. He knows we're hiding. He knows where we are. He knows what we've been pursuing. But he wants you to give his life because here's what he says. You're not lemon scented or 33% stronger. I'm going to make you brand new. Not a better version of yourself. I'm going to give you a brand new life. The life you've been living is gone. We just said that in 2 Corinthians 5.17. The old way will be gone according to God. So if you'll stand with me real quick and don't even bat an eye. There's an opportunity this Christmas for you this season For you to have a new Christmas. Listen, maybe there's some things in your life, the reason God hasn't moved in the people's lives that you're around is maybe because you haven't surrendered. You haven't told God that I'm hiding. God, I don't want those things to be my focal point of worship anymore. I want it to be you. Maybe the only reason God's not moving is because you haven't moved. You haven't fully surrendered your, your life. And so with everybody's eyes closed, that's really just for privacy. It's all it is. Respect that. Whether you're a sinner, you recognize today that, man, I've recognized for the first time I am sinful. Or maybe I've just been hiding for God. My life has gotten off track. I've been derailed. Satan fooled me into thinking that something else was worth my worship. Either way, could, I just, could you just slip your hand up so I would know? Thank you. All over. All over. You can put them down. I want to pray for you. God, there's people, God, you, you know their hearts and their minds, God. They just heard your word, God, and they, they want to respond, Lord. They're not satisfied with just recognizing, Lord, that they're, they're off track. God, that they're missing the mark, that they're full of sin. Lord, they want to respond to that. 
Lord, they, they've bought into a lie, but today they hear your truth, Lord, and they, it's worth following, Lord. And they want to put their identity and their worth and their value into you today, God. They want to get on track or back on track, God. They need to be a new creation, God. And they, they recognize that only you can make them a new creation. So God, this time of year, Lord, where we reflect on gifts, God, we want to recognize that your son was the greatest gift this world could ever receive, God. But we want to make an impact. We want to have significant significance in this life, Lord, and the people around us, Lord. We don't just want to be mediocre people or we want to be extra special, Lord, that follows you, Lord. And when you tell us to move, we move. And God, today we 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 give our lives to you, Lord, and all the sinful things that we've done, the lifestyles we live, God. We know that you have unconditional love, Lord. We want to be an unconditional church, Lord, that creates an environment, Lord, where we reflect, reflect accurately, God, what you think about us and that we are so valuable. We are your treasure. And God, you just want our worship. You want our hearts and our lives, God. And thank you for an environment where we can do that. We can, we can take that step, God. I thank you for lives changed forever today. And Lord, those others that are back on track, God. And God, I'd ask you just to stack things in their life, God, that, that gives them the opportunity to be obedient. God, that they would seek your word, Lord. They would get clarification, Lord, because they sought you out in reading your word and being around people that, that value your word. God, right now, I pray for next week as people... They come out of the woodwork, God. We thank God for that. That they're going to try church, Lord. They're going to they're gonna come check you out, God. And that they have no idea you're going to assault them with your love. And God, you're going to bring a message that just makes it undeniable. God, who would turn down the love that you offer, God? Help us to be a church that is ready to respond, Lord, to hopelessness and helplessness. God, that when, when issues arise and crises happen, God, that we won't be so in shock, Lord, that we're, we won't be able to be any help to other people, God, that we'll be able to provide hope and your truth, God, your word that provides comfort. Thank you for lives today. They're, Lord, they're not only going to heaven, they're making an impact immediately, Lord. They're going to they're gonna experience opportunity, Lord, to cross paths with people, Lord, that they never thought that they would, God. And they're going to make a high impact. And God, in the next few moments, we just want to worship you, God. We want to remove all the things in our minds that have just dominated us for so many weeks, months, or years, God. And today we want to worship you fully and accurately, God. We want to make you the top priority. We want to make you number one. We want to make you first, God. God, you have our best in mind. You have our best plan. God, I thank you for this time of worship, God, that we can just lift you up, God, and just make your name famous. God, I pray for people and the things that are just aching in their heart, God. They have nowhere to turn, nowhere to go. And at this moment, God, they, they are hearing your voice and they are around your people. God, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Give a hand clap to people who gave their life to Christ and are getting back on track. That's a pretty big deal. Listen, I'm going to worship. Uh, Sally's going to come up and make some announcements after we're done, but forget that. This is worship time. This is a time of worship. So if you just keep your, where you are and just give him all you got.